Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Raggio. I'm a senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies and editor of FDD's Long War Journal. And this is Generation Jihad, the podcast that covers what used to be known as the global war on terror and what we call the long war. Today, I have a very special guest, um, the esteemable John Batchelor, the host of CBS Eye on the World. John is the consummate professional. Professional, He has the ability to expertly cover a multitude of topics. I, I honestly don't know how John does this, but I certainly admire it. Uh, John, I've known John for 17 years now, I believe it is. He's uh, one, of, one of the first people I've ever done radio with. He's been a mentor, and I, I, I consider John to be uh, an excellent colleague, and, and he's become a, a good friend of mine. John, welcome to Generation Jihad. It truly is an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Bill. And I'm a fan of Generation Jihad. You know that. I listen to you each week. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's kind of inside, behind the stage, on the stage at the it's, same time. It's amazing, John. And, and you were certainly an inspiration for Tom Jocelyn and I to, to start this show. And, and you've given me very valuable tips over the years. Um, I, I, again, I just can't thank you enough for, um, for, for everything you've done for me. Well, you're, you're welcome, Bill, but you brought, you brought the war to my audience for, you said 17 years. I remember our first time together, I think it was 2004. So that's 15 years. It's uh 2005. I'll, years. I'll, I'll, I'll tell that story. I, I, this is one of my favorite stories to tell, um, and for listeners, if you're not aware, I'm a regular in John's, uh, John's show. Um, weekly, I think I've been a weekly guest on your show for, I think for 17 years now, John, because it was 2005. A, a while, a while. A yeah. While. And, um, so it is, it's a, it's both terrifying and, and enjoyable for me to turn the tables and interview John today. I'm going to tell my quick story, uh, my quick John Bachelor story. And look, I have, um, there's several, you know, you, you have a career. And you certainly have your um, the things that you you say these are my greatest achievements. Long War Journal being banned in Pakistan um, is certainly at the, one of the top ones. Um, the reporting we've done on Afghanistan, particularly the map, how that evolved over time. I can I can go on and on. You know how we predicted Zawahiri was going to be in Afghanistan, but this, I'm not I'm not lying when I say this. I I, I tell this story to to anyone who will listen to me. Um, I listened to the John Bachelor show on, I believe you were on 770 AM about two decades ago. Yeah. WABC starting uh, uh, starting September 12th, 2001. Yes. So I've been listening for that long. My, I live in Southern New Jersey. My sister lives in Northern New Jersey. Um, me and the family late night. This is how I started, you know, just surfing the radio before you had Spotify or anything like that to pipe through. Um, just start cycling through. And I found John's show by accident. And I said to myself, wow, if I, this is before I did got into this business. If I could ever be on a radio show, it's, it's John show. And look, I'm not making this up folks. I, my wife can attest to this. I just love the way you covered everything. Like you could, you'd have a guest from Uzbekistan and then you'd be talking about space exploration and NASA. And it was, you just did it with uh, such style, precision and expertise. Um, and I, I just loved it. I, I became a, a regular listener. Then flash forward to 2005. I'm getting ready to embed with the U.S. Marines in Western Iraq. And your producer at the time, I believe it was Lee Mason. She, uh, right, right. She, she contacted me and said, hey, Bill, when you get back, John would love to have you on the show. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, I could rent a satellite phone and I could call you from Belusia and Ramadi and El Qaim and Haditha and everywhere else I'm going. And Lee was like, that's great. Uh, get in touch with us once you're there. And um, what we did the interviews. Uh, I remember one, one of the interviews there was, a, I was on a base in Ramadi and there was like a mortar attack that happened either while we were doing it through the call or, or right before or right after. I can't recall it, but I remember telling you about this. I'm like, John, you're not going to believe this. Um, and yeah. And then I think I've been a regular I think it woke you up, Bill. My memory is that you guys were stirring when report of the attack oh, came in. I don't remember. That was a different situation. That one was in Mosul. Um, 
Oh, right. At the big city of Mosul, the first time I'd ever talked to Mosul. Yes. So that was in, in, um, uh, it was on Easter morning in 2008. And that was a suicide, one of the largest suicide attacks. It was carried out by a former Guantanamo detainee, but we learned later, um, massive suicide attack. And yeah, we talked that day. I remember that was quite an emotional day as well. So we shared, we shared a lot of time, John and I, um, uh, from the field. I think we did reports from Afghanistan as well. Um, and, and I think every embed I did, I talked to you over the phone and I, I, John, thank you. You, I think, I actually think you were the second person I did radio with. Um, and, and it's just been a pleasure to be on your show ever since. Well, thank you, Bill. And, and it's a treat to have you year after year as we stay with the story. We don't wander off. We've got our eyes on what we've been talking about for, well, 15, 17 years uh, repeatedly, which is the threat remains and the ambitions of our adversaries are large, very large. Well said. I mean, John, it's um, that's that's what I love about doing your program is you just you focus, you understand these critical issues. You, you take a take a wide view of this and attack or a, a, a killing of a terrorist leader or a, a one event. It's never just one. You put it in the, the, the wider context. I remember when I first started doing your show, I was very afraid to um, to go beyond what was just in front of me, what happened that day, what that event was. And you taught me how to, how to look at it into a broader context. Sure. We could talk about the strike that killed Zawahiri, but what does that mean in the bigger picture? And that's something um, that you, that you are expert at doing. And, and that's why I really always enjoy doing your program every week. It's, it's on my calendar and I, um, I, it's, it's just a highlight of my week. So, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm sorry everyone for fanboying on John. Um, but I am a fanboy of John's and I have to admit it. We've covered a lot, John, right? We've, we talked about, again, I started with covering the, 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 U.S. occupation in Afghanistan and U.S. military operations to defeat Al Qaeda in Iraq. And then we talked the drone strikes in Pakistan. There's another one of those professional accomplishments embedding. Those are things that I'm very proud of doing. Um, the drone campaign in Pakistan and then uh, the, the surge in Afghanistan and what everything that was happening there. But this is we're at the one year anniversary of the U.S. withdrawal in Afghanistan. And um, wow, we've discussed Afghanistan from the very beginning on your show as well. So today's episode, we're going to focus on Afghanistan. I know I often joke on this program that uh, I wish I can get away from it, but there's some things that you just can't escape. And Afghanistan is one of those. I know you know this well, John. I mean, you've been, like you said, you started September 12th, uh, 2001. So Af- Afghanistan was was very clearly on on your plate. Um, were you based at in New York on the, the attacks of 9-11, John? Were you working out of the city? Yeah, I, and the attack came uh, the Tuesday of the 11th on Saturday night. I've told this story before. Saturday night, I did a show with my colleague, Paul Alexander, four hours on WABC, a hobby show. This is not, I didn't have a local show then, a daily show. And we concentrated on the attack of the USS Cole in in off of Yemen in October of 2000 and spoke with the admiral of the second fleet and the fifth fleet who was responsible for that attack. And he told us how he'd been to the FBI building that very week and asked, how's the investigation going? And then I spoke to other people who were counterterrorism experts. And I learned the name of a man named Bin Laden. I'd never heard it before. I learned an organization called Al Qaeda. This is September 8th. And my engineer that night listened to the show as we ran through it, finished it. And on Tuesday, he had a sister in one building and a firefighter brother-in-law on the street uh, after the attack. So he called me up and he said, who did this? So Accidentally, I had a good, uh, I had a good opinion. There were only so many groups that had ever conducted themselves in such a fashion, suicide attack at that scale. And I named Al Qaeda. And the reason I then became a broadcaster, a daily broadcaster was the program director and the general manager at WABC hearing that I knew who was attacking the day of the attack. 
because we hadn't had that news from Washington yet, invited me to come on the next night saying they couldn't put Dr. Laura Schlesinger on, you know, advice for the lovelorn, just until we figured things out. And I've never been off air. And you were one of the people I met over the years who, who kept the audience informed about that original attack, always back to the moment where 9-11, where we saw the city burning. I took the, I took the children out of school that morning. I lived in the Upper West Side. We went to the high point in Central Park, the playground up there, and we could see the burning city. And the cloud that was coming up, the debris cloud that was coming up from the the towers and the destruction, the wind shifted and we could smell it throughout the city that day and for days afterwards. So when I was invited to do the broadcast the next night, morning, the next night, I'd never done a live radio show in a fashion that is necessary for live talk radio during the week. You have to hit your marks and I couldn't. I didn't know how to do it. You know, there are a bunch of buttons you push and you're talking to the microphone. So I brought along the only CD I thought that was appropriate to the moment, which was the movie Gladiator. And I told the engineer, play this at the beginning and end of every segment, and that'll cover the fact that I I can't get in and out on time. And so after that, ever since, I always played Hollywood music to start and end. And the show I have now at CBS they composed something for me because, you know, they are CBS, Planet CBS. They composed something for me that was comparable for the Hollywood music that I used over the years. And then using that Hollywood music, the show business of it, I then found you, Bill, and I found Tom, and I found all the other people who were ready to comment and go to theater. I was never permitted by ABC at the time or subsequent ownership to travel to Iraq. I wanted to be there in 2005 uh, for the election and for the transformation of Iraq into a republic. But I wasn't permitted because they didn't want to pay for the insurance. Who knows? Corporate media. Well, I, uh, who paid for your insurance? I did. Well, my, my listen, my readers did. Um, I was, I, so, and I did cover that election in, uh, actually in Haditha, towns of Heath, Haditha and Barwana. And it was amazing. We got to talk about that on air, right? I remember doing your program. Yeah, on we, that. Did. we did. We did. I wasn't able to go, but you. Yeah. Were. And the insurance, I will tell you this, that insurance was expensive. I think it was something like six or 7,000. This is in 2005, six or $7,000 a month. That, that sounds about right. I was told about. Yeah. And enough. it was not easy to get. I think I had to do, I can't remember who it was. It was one of the big London insurance houses. Like, um, and I just, I forget the name cause it's been so long. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, John, it's, you know, nine 11 changed us. Right. I mean, it, uh, it must've been devastating to, to watch the buildings burn, um, from New York city. My, my short story is, my brother-in-law worked in the North Tower and my sister worked in a building a couple nearby and they actually witnessed it on the ferry. But I, when communications went down, uh, I didn't hear from them for 24 hours and they were. Sh- right. The Verizon, the Verizon Towers went yeah. down. We didn't have calm that day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it, I think it was about 16 hours before I, I was prepared to, to go to New York City to try and find them. Um, and, and, you know, I get that call. It's a hard to not be emotional about that, you know, 21 plus years later, but, um, you know, it brought us to this moment, right? I mean, we're, we're here because of this. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's funny what gets us here. Um, and you know, I, I just, I want to hear your stories about these, these moments in time. We're going to talk about the invasion of Afghanistan. You know, what, what were your perceptions of this? And uh, maybe we'll just jump right into this and, you know, 9-11 9-11 happens within six weeks. You know, we find out it's Al-Qaeda. Um, we, the U.S. invades. You're covering this. Um, I'm listening to your coverage. It's fantastic. fantastic. And I think there's a sense of elation and, and sense of, of, of vengeance that, that comes, comes with after, after the U.S. Is, is fighting the Taliban, is fighting Al-Qaeda, is getting, getting revenge against our enemies. Uh, what was the media coverage was like? What was your coverage like? Were you optimistic about our prospects moving forward at this time? 
I was until Bora Bora, December 2001. Uh, the U.S. jumps in in October, special forces from the north, and approaches Cabo from the north. I remember the famous press conference where Donald Rumsfeld, then Secretary of Defense, who was spectacular, explaining things to the American public, said, we're, we're running out of targets because Afghanistan was a pri primitive environment kept by the Taliban. But Bora Bora is a mountainous region in eastern Afghanistan. Bill keeps the maps. He can point right to it. And there was said to be a safe haven for the bad actors from Taliban and from Al Qaeda. There was also a pass from Bora Bora over into Pakistan. And various players were charged with tracking down bin Laden. He was by himself. He was moving with his, his gunmen, but we're really not talking about Vladimir Putin and the defense ministry of Russia. We're talking about gangsters. And the explanation as to why it didn't end there is elaborate, but it comes down to Pakistan safe haven and the inability of the U.S. to resolve the conflict of who to trust and who not to trust in Afghanistan. We trusted the wrong people and they betrayed us. They let bin Laden go. And at that moment, Bill, when bin Laden was confirmed not dead in B-52 strikes, but in Pakistan, I knew we had a problem. I didn't know the scale of it. I didn't know that was December 2001. I didn't know that I'd be in Krakow in 2011. May 1st is my memory. When we'd heard that, when we heard the news that bin Laden was dead in Pakistan, where he went in 2001. And in those intervening 10 years to keep this story fresh, we had to constantly refer to the fact that Pakistan was not trustworthy. And yet nothing was done. The Bush administration, the Obama administration, nothing was done about Pakistan. We now report on Pakistan each week, you and I, with Ambassador Hussein Akane. And Pakistan remains a troubled nation of bad actors, non-transparent governance, and doubts about the ISI, the secret services that you've reported on for years. The same story 20 years later, Bill. The one from Bora Bora is here today with us right now. Yeah, I, John, I could not agree more. The, the battle of Tora Bora, that was when my, you know, the concern meter started pegging out on me. Uh, the, you know, I, I really attribute this as much as Rumsfeld was a good communicator. I don't think he understood this war. We needed to commit a massive amount of forces. We needed to send everything in surround it we need this 10th mountain should have been on on a plane 82nd 101st all three ranger battalions yeah and a couple of calls to islamabad don't yeah, you it, dare we're coming. coupled with you know i know i know the threat was made to nuke them or to bomb them back to the stone age but there was never any demonstration of to the pakistanis of how serious we were and we should, the message we should have been given is walk out or nothing walks out of here. No blade of grass, no frog, no bird. We, you know, that should have been what happened at Tora Bora. And we didn't. And they escaped and they went into Pakistan and they regrouped. And here we are today, as you said, 20 plus years later, and we're dealing with the same problems. And, and, and Al Qaeda itself is because of this, Al Qaeda has metastasized. It went from, uh, a group on the run in the in the mountains of Tora Bora to going to Pakistan to um, and 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 st establishing branches throughout the world and fostering insurgencies where they didn't exist in places and and we talk about this often on your on on your show every week um, and this is again this is why I, I'm just always fascinated to do it though how the fight has spread to Somalia and to into to countries like Benin, where we, there was never a jihadist problem in the past. And these are the things that, uh, that, that we, uh, we, te we tease out on your program on a regular basis. In 2001, I learned there was a plan called Caliphate 2020. And it was bin Laden's plan. I believe elements of it were captured when bin Laden was killed in 2011, the document troll, uh, hall and global and Jihad, uh, Caliphate 2020, divided the world up into 
sectors and that the vision here, the delusion, but there was a vision, was that we're going to overwhelm all these governances with our with our suicide attacks and that they will all fall and that the world will obey Allah and our version of, of Islam and there will be nobody preventing it. That was the vision from 2001. The vision is still in place. Changed the date a little bit, but Zawahiri practiced that. The reason I know it is because you and Tom and Long Word Journal reported it every time he'd make a a, host, a tape that was like it was like hostage tape. He was talking about some spiritual reality somewhere that was inconsistent with the day's events. But I'd learned since 2001 to take them deadly seriously because though they are delusional, they are violent men and our society still is not capable of stopping a suicide. The the dismissal of the of their goals and um, look, I mean, they certainly the, their plan was ambitious. I think they overestimated their capabilities, but this plan is still in effect, and and we're seeing you know again the the, the, the jihad for Al Qaeda, and now we have a competitor with the Islamic State. It's metastasized in regions and on continents where it didn't exist before. Is it going as well as they had hoped? Did their 20 year plan work out? No, it didn't. But I think they're certainly further, uh, um, you know, they're, they're uh, far more effective than the U S which was optimistic that it would defeat Al Qaeda and, and stabilize Afghanistan. You know, if you would have told U S officials 20 years ago that the jihad would have expanded to the, to the degree that it has, I think they probably would have laughed at you. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 that is, that's a, that's a fascinating point. Um, yeah, it's something that Tom and I over the years have, have worked hard to, you know, you're right though. It's, it's like a hostage video watching these guys. You it, horrific at time. We've seen the bloody Islamic state snuff films, murdering people. Um, and it's really the ugly part of this job is trying to, is watching this stuff because you have to, and because you need to. And the only way to understand your enemy is to understand what they're saying and what they're doing. And these tapes give you a lot of information, unfortunately. Now, a video, Bill, let's go to the last couple of years. Video that you recounted each week when I talked to you from the provinces of the Taliban, the gangsters overrunning this or that outpost, driving around in vehicles given to the Afghan National Army, the Afghan police by the U.S., showing their hall of supplies, you know, videotapes, games, junk food from these provinces. Week after week, Bill, we'd say, you know, this doesn't look stable here. They're, they're, they're boasting about how they've overrun another outpost. And there were no bodies around because the Afghan National Army ran away if they were ever there. Week after week, Bill, CENTCOM saw that just as we did. Certainly there were honest players at CENTCOM who understood what they were witnessing. The gradual encroachment of, of the Taliban over Kabul. Do we yet have an explanation for how they explained it to, the, to their superiors and how they rationalized that they weren't watching the inevitable. Yeah, John, I think this is the result of um, the particularly at the, at, I know people within the military, people within the intelligence communities were very concerned about this because I, I speak with them, but the commanders, the military commanders or political leaders they dismissed this. General Miller dismissed a lot of this. I recall, um, I think we talked about this on air. There was a district in um, Helmand province. I can't remember if it was um, Musakala. I think it was Musakala. And the Taliban overran the district. And after it was cont heavily contested, U.S. forces were and Afghan forces were confined to, to small pockets within the districts. And it was actually U.S. forces weren't there anymore. And they finally overran it. And the and instead of admitting that the district became fully Taliban controlled, uh, the resolute support, which was the was the final U.S. command at the time, issued a press release that essentially and I joked about this, which but I was serious. My characterization of their press release was we had to destroy the district center to save it. They carpet bombed the place and then they pulled out and they moved the district center to a remote area of the district where it had no influence. That was, you know, that press release to me was like I knew they didn't understand or, or if they understood 
they were papering it over. And because at that point in time, General Miller and other U.S. military commanders, they drank the Kool-Aid that it was. Um, th- th- and we know this from right when Sigar was releasing the data for the map, which really helped me do my work. They cut it off. And what they, what did they say? They said, well, security in the districts isn't the, the metric for peace in Afghanistan or success. The metric is negotiations with the Taliban. And once that mentality set in, the commanders, they just stopped paying attention at what's happening in the district. And they put all their hopes and, and, um, desires into the, um, the success of so-called peace talks with the Taliban. And that's how you lose a war. I, I think that's what happened. And I think that's what we documented over the years. Um, we were watching the Taliban chip away at Afghanistan. That's what the, what the map showed, right? One to three percent every quarter. The Taliban were, were ex- expanding their influence in the remote areas of Afghanistan. Doesn't seem like much every quarter until you start adding it up. And then by the time the negotiations or by the time the Biden administration announced the withdrawal, you had about uh, uh, I would think it was estimated about an eighth of the districts were Taliban controlled or something like seventh and another about quarter were contested. And that just blew up with the Taliban offensive. They didn't if they either they didn't want to understand what was happening or they understood and they buried it. I think it was probably a combination of the two. But they once the once presidents start telling you we're leaving and that's our strategy. I think uh, rationality goes out the door. And this isn't a criticism of those of you in the um in the uh, they were doing the hard work. I know you understood what was happening. It was your generals. It was your leaders who 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 failed you and who failed Afghanistan. Irony alert. This is a statement from the secretary of state within these hours. In the face of the Taliban's unwillingness or inability to abide by their commitments, we will continue to support the Afghan people with robust humanitarian assistance and to advocate for the protection of their human rights, especially of women and girls, Mr. Blinken said in a statement. He also went on to say that the Taliban had grossly violated, grossly is highlighted, the Doha agreement by hosting and sheltering al-Qaeda. Bill, in order to be Secretary of State, you've got to be part actor and part, what you'd have to say, sage. At this point, the actor is getting the better of the Secretary of State. Uh, we're to believe that at no point in these last years, with all the anal- analysts at CENTCOM and at the DOD and at the think tanks and at FDD, telling week after week, if you leave Afghanistan, the Taliban is going to return along with Al Qaeda week after week. We have to believe now that it ne- that memo never got to the Secretary of State in 2021. We have 2021. I didn't see it. I didn't know. The question I have for you, Bill, because we'll, we'll I'll leave Mr. Blinken to his memoirs. The question I have for you, Bill, is did you see a report out of CENTCOM or state at any point in these last years that if we leave or lose or back away from supporting the governments, Karzai and then the, his successors, that 40 million people will be at risk? And that 20 of them will be starving within the year. Did you see that report? Well, uh, for, before that, I want to add used salesmen to the list of uh, sec- the jobs of the, the secretary of state that has to take on. Um, no, there was no such report. The, the, the people that I spoke to, and a lot of this is internal, right? So the, the, we're not seeing publicly. They knew that Afghanistan would fall to the Taliban. They knew that there'd be predations. Uh, but I don't think people were were able to predict the humanitarian disaster that was to befall. And they knew that the Taliban would start to, um, you know, would restrict girls' rights, this women's rights and girls going to school. They knew the Taliban 2.0 was Taliban, Taliban 1.0. Um, but this wasn't a message that was well-received by the leadership. So, um, yeah. So you didn't see a report about food security. It just didn't cross no, your no, desk. No, it, it may, it, no, it, it, I think it was, uh, I think even that was, a bit surprising for me. We, we saw evidence of concern about this towards the tail end of it, of the U.S. Um, once the U.S. was announcing the, um, it was leaving. 
Um, and I think what wasn't factored in here is how much money was pouring into the, from the U.S. government and from NATO countries into Afghanistan to to prop up everything, its food supplies, its medicine, medical supplies. We should have known this, but nobody was warning. And it wasn't in the cigar reports, the special investigator general for Afghanistan reconstruction. It wasn't in State Department reports. Um, no one no one calculated that part, myself included. So. We do remember Secretary of State Powell. We do General Powell, Secretary of State Powell, saying, if you break it, you own it. And that was always applied to Iraq, but it applies to Afghanistan as well. Yeah, I, you know, John, that's interesting, but I don't think we broke Afghanistan. Afghanistan was a broken country when we had to, when we went in there. Um, it was ruled by the, the Taliban uh, monsters. They didn't care about their, their people. They didn't care. And, I, you know, this is I'm, I'm going to get into our next point here. Right. Our next point of discussion here our first failures in Afghanistan after Tora Bora, after not recognizing Pakistan, how we failed to. And I'm very interested in how you viewed this because you really watched. And I know you had people on your show talking about the development of Afghanistan. And these to me were things that that we could have controlled. Pakistan was always a very difficult um, situation to control. I don't think we ever acted forcefully with Pakistan to, to help get that to our, um, into our advantage, but the creation of the Afghan government, we created a government that we wanted for Afghanistan instead of one that was needed by the Afghan people. We centralized power with the president, the president appointed district level governors. So a, 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 a situation that was ripe for um, for corruption, which there's no shortage of corrupt actors in Afghanistan. So think of the president of the United States appointing uh, whatever you, the leader of a county here would be in the United States, a county administrator or or the, the, the mayor of a major city. That's that's something that we put in. Um, Afghanistan is a very decentralized country and needed a very decentralized government where power was more uh, appropriately wielded. Um, yeah, I'm just giving my opinion here. I'm curious to see what you think the, ne the next step failures were. And also, we did the same thing with the military. Um, we created a very centralized military that was that was dependent on the U.S. for air power, for logistics, for medical support, for medic medevac, for um, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. And we saw what happened and maintenance. And we saw what happens once we shut off the ISR, once we shut off the maintenance, once we set up, shut off. Um, Everything that the Afghan Air Force and the Afghan military needed to operate over the summer. Um, I think those were two, two major and also over committing to nation building. That gets to your point about, you know, you break it, you bought it. Um, we poured so much money into Afghanistan that we fed the monster of corruption there, which never, um, didn't allow the Afghanistan to, to, um, to, to grow as it needed, not as we want. Um, what are your thoughts on that, John? Central Asia Bill. Afghanistan is integral to the success of the civilization of Central Asia, 2,000, 4,000 years. I learned in traveling to Central Asia, Tashkent, and also the South Caucasus. All of these states were joined by large cities with science, with experiments. This is before Rome, during Rome, quite indifferent to Rome. Uh, Kabul was one of the major city states. Trade, a scholarship, all of this before Islam and after Islam, all of it. And we're, we're dealing with peoples who inherited all that by instinct. Now, Afghanistan is a particular tr uh, crisis for us now because we see it as a medieval place. It's not. It actually dates back to about the 17th century, somewhere in there. We, we look pretty crude too in the 17th century. However, at no point did, did I learn in Tashkent or in Baku or in Tbilisi or in Alma Ata that you write this region off because we have a, a weak education system or because we don't have transparency in our governance or because we've been conquered. You don't write it off. And so, yes, Afghanistan was not healthy. It was Broken, I agree. Broken by the Soviets, broken by the uh, the abuse of of the co uh, colonial powers in the early 20th century, 
broken by the British Empire and the great game in the 19th century. Not to make excuses. These are violent men who are the Taliban. And some come from Pakistan, some come from Taliban. But at no point does the situation improve when you abandon them. That doesn't make things better. I do not at this point have any reason to believe that Pakistan, that Afghanistan and Pakistan won't be back in the news of the United States. This is a deeply troubled reason, region with nuclear arms and with men who have very little to hold them back from their ideology of my way or I kill you. That's who they are. So these many decades later, two decades we've been there. That's, that's a moment in time of the, of these ancient civilizations. When I say ancient, I mean, civilization itself dates back to, well, we, we talk of the Egyptians, right? Well, Central Asia is that old. And, uh, and I learned when I was there to have, to have respect for the fact that, uh, they come from some place that needs to be honored and they think about it. Uh, I met Afghanistan citizens, businessmen who were looking, this is before the fall, who were looking to reestablish businesses in Kabul and build up their infrastructure. And once again, invite small business and international organizations into Kabul. All that is gone now. But in the summer of 19, I had those conversations at a meeting. It took place in, I guess I was in Tashkent for that meeting. And there are lots of young people throughout from Mongolia to Georgia who talk about developing this region on, uh, in the 21st century as a source of energy. And what do they want to be? They want to be like us, Bill. They want to have Amazon. They want to have homes that are, that are, that are dry. That's their ambition. I'm not trying to make them sound pathetic. I'm trying to say it's a great resource. And the U.S. decision a year past was to walk away. Yeah. And a disastrous decision. I think that uh, we're going to, we're, we'll, we'll be working our way towards that, John. Um, it certainly was a disastrous uh, decision. Um, which does not have an explanation, no. Bill. Each week yeah. I ask you, where is it? Yeah. There are supposed to be reports. Does anybody even talk about why we don't have? Them? You know, I, 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 I found this quote from President Biden. I'm power, going to paraphrase it. He basically says this was on August 20th as the withdrawal is um, nearing its end. And it's the, the, the wheels are coming off. The doors are coming off of Afghanistan. Um, the engine is just leaking oil all over the place. And he says, Al Qaeda is not in Afghanistan. Why do we need to be there anymore? What 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 is the reason for us to be there? And yet here we go. And again, I realize we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but to you know, just trying to drive home that point. And yet we strike and uh, we kill Zayman Al Zawahiri in Afghanistan, and then that's touted as a success for you know what you know at what point will we get an explanation that this policy was a failure of recognition? Uh, I don't expect one because I, this administration doesn't take responsibility for its actions. Not that any other one that I could think of in recent memory does either. But, um, John, I'm going to move forward to, uh, so we have the establishment of the Afghan government, the Afghan military. Things look pretty good, even though Al Qaeda slipped away across the border. We have some issues in Northwestern, in the Northwest frontier province, now a uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province in uh in those uh tribal agencies particularly north and south waziristan you have the rise of the islamic uh emirate of waziristan al-qaeda islamic movement in Uzbekistan. these groups are fighting the pakistani state and they win and then the taliban the afghan taliban uses this um and is plotting its its insurgency as well within afghanistan and they slowly start creeping their way back 2004 2005 to that by 2006 we start seeing high level of violence um increasing across afghanistan not just in eastern afghanistan not just in the south but we're seeing it in places like kunduz and in the, and in the west uh, western afghanistan as well and then the bush administration kicks off the drone campaign in pakistan that's targeting top al-qaeda leaders um as well as Taliban members, members of the Haqqani network, which the Haqqanis, of course, um, are a member of the Taliban. You have all of this going on at the same time. 
is this where you really start to see the wheels come off of, of Afghanistan where where I mean we knew there was a problem with Tora Bora but is this the point where you start start the alarm bells start going off for you what what I, I'm trying it's all a little fuzzy but what happened is Iraq became the lead story every day and Afghan there was no room for Afghanistan because there was nothing comparably violent there were NATO deployments that were as much social workers, there were combat. And I remember speaking to someone who had just come back from Afghanistan and he told the strangest story. I, I remember it vividly. He said, driving down a road, I was home and we were driving dr- down a road in an SUV. He wasn't driving. I think he was being driven by a friend of his. And for whatever reason, the friend decided to pull off the road. Just, you know, in the, in the side of the road, nothing dramatic, not highway or anything, country road. And the man who told me the story said he, he threw himself down in the floor of the car. That was his instinct because he'd just come back from Afghanistan. And if you go off the road, you're going to hit a mine. And I remember thinking at the time, what's happened to Afghanistan? You know, why, why don't we hear more about this? The, the, the roadsides are mined. What? And then I remember, and I can't remember what year it was. Might have been 10, 11 or 12, somewhere in there. I was speaking every day to the 101st air, every week to the 101st airborne that was deployed. What is that province in the South? Zar- it starts with a Z. I can't remember. Zabel. Zabel. 101st airborne was deployed there and my informant was with the 101st. And they were running exercises out to villages to find Taliban who were sneaking back into Afghanistan. And they were running convoys. And I remember speaking to one young officer for the 101st. I believe that's the 101st. I don't want to. Get I think that's wrong. right, John. I remember that you were speaking with them. I do recall this. Yes. And then weeks later, I learned that he'd been killed by an IED. And he'd been he'd stopped his convoy. To help, a, uh, to help one of his soldiers and the, the IED had got him. And there was, it was very sad. And I, I inquired about him being buried. And the first thing I thought of, or one of the first things I thought of, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in that region was what, why, why did we lose him? What, what, how can the president say it doesn't matter that we lost him? Uh, delivering supplies is what he was doing at the time. It's, it's a, it's a story that gets all wrapped up into all the years in which Afghanistan was no longer a lead story. We talk about it, Bill, each week. I think we were pri- by ourselves yeah, some. We months. were. This is Generation Jihad. I'm your host, Bill Raggio. Today, our special guest is John Batchelor. Uh, he's host of CBS Eye on the World, a friend of mine. And uh, John, again, it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, yeah, we, we go from that point where the Taliban are resurgent, the, um, you know, we see Al Qaeda metastasizing in, in Pakistan. Um, they're providing support to the Taliban. Pakistani Taliban are, are providing support. President o- Obama is elected and he announces that he's going to do a surge. It was sort of foisted on him, if you recall, by the U.S. military. And then he he says, I'll do a surge, but it's only going to be 18 months to two years. And when I say it's done, it's done. You know, th- so the good war was good, right, John? But like, it wasn't so good that he was going to commit to it. Um, this is this is the time period when your friend died. I I think this, this one bothers me to the core, the surge. Um, and look, I can talk about political failures um, from both the left and the right, from Republicans and Democrats, to me, the surge was one of the more cynical things. I, at least it used to be the, the the most cynical thing until President Biden announced the withdrawal um, last year and threw the Afghans under the bus at the, at the same time. But he announces a surge and going to take the fight to the Taliban. More American soldiers, including that soldier, that officer from the 101st, died in that about two to three year period of the surge than died in the rest of the war combined. Um, and it was for a surge that was under resourced that nobody really believed was truly going to work. You had some pundits out there pumping it up, but 
Look, Tom Jocelyn and I, we said from the beginning, this would not work. This is not going to. And we knew because it was under resourced because it only focused on some areas. It wasn't, they didn't hit the Taliban on in, in, in multiple fronts at the same time. And nothing was ever done about Pakistan. At the same time, we continued to f- supply billions of dollars to Pakistan in order to bribe them. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on this period of time, John? Is that the, is that, does that, it was Petraeus in this, uh, the yes. surge, but General McChrystal is that the General same Petraeus. period where the, where the Haqqani network was activated along the border region and was striking, or did that come after? So the, during the sur, you know, the Haqqanis were active before Surajuddin Haqqani became a wanted individual. Uh, he's now, by the way, the Taliban's uh, deputy emir, as well as their interior minister. Um, shows you how important he was. The, the first reward that came, he's, he's Al Qaeda. Is he, he is it indeed. Um, he, the first re- reward for him was like fifty or a hundred thousand dollars. He now has a ten million dollar bounty on his head. They were um, the, the Haqqanis were, remember, they were directing some of these major attacks in Kabul. It was in that transition period from the revival of of the Taliban and in through the surge where they were conducting these uh, massive attacks. And, and yes, the Haqqanis were active in the east at this time as well. Um, we, we did. This is the period where we saw the 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 rise of the Haqqani network and its deep ties with Al Qaeda. And the Haqqani network, I remember you reporting on the suicide attack at a CIA base somewhere in the border region that killed several officers at the same time. And I remember thinking then Al Qaeda is working very smoothly here to strike back at elements of the U.S. deployment. What does this mean? But it never added up to anything except for the Obama administration and then the Trump administration and then the Biden administration telling us Al Qaeda was on the road to defeat. And there's uh, uh, that's still the, the case that is made by Washington. They've been on the road to defeat for a dozen years. Yeah, that was, you know, that, I always say the D words, right? They're done. They're decimated. They're defeated. They're degraded. These are all the words that successive administrations told us about Al Qaeda. Um, and they had to tell us this, right, John? Because you can't leave Afghanistan if Al Qaeda is still there in strength and, and, and also is deeply embedded with the Taliban. And yet that's what we got. Um, the Obama administration wanted to leave at the end of 14 and then that was delayed. And then the election, I, it all gets fuzzy, Bill, as to why it was that the Obama people didn't leave because there was that plan to leave. Do you remember what what changed their it, mind? It is. So we had the surge. The Taliban basically fought hard enough to bloody us to make it pay, but they essentially retreated into Pac- its top leadership retreated and, and the bulk of its forces back into Pakistan or in a, also into Iran as well. Um, by 2014, the U.S.'s transitions um, day-to-day security operations to the Afghan government. And I forget which year, but the U.S. Um, opened up negotiations with the Taliban. Um, I want to say that was 2013, might have been 2012, it might have been 14. And there were specific demands placed on the Taliban. And this is a good transition into our discussion of the Trump deal. But here's what the U.S. essentially asked for. The Taliban would denounce al-Qaeda. The Taliban would open negotiations with the Afghan government and join into an inclusive government with it, that they would ex- respect human rights and women's rights, and they would respect the the constitution. The Taliban didn't agree to a single one. And to the Obama administration's credit, they walked away because they knew that was a political loser for them at the time. I think President Obama, whatever mistakes he made in Afghanistan, he made the right decision. It would not have reflected well on him if he cut that deal and left left Afghanistan. So he punted. He kicked it down the road to the next administration. It was either going to be President Trump or, or President Obama. Does that sound right, John? Is that the, the time? Yes. It, uh, uh, as I recall, it was uh, something that wasn't obvious at the time. Afterwards, we see that it was left to the next administration. It was assumed at the time would be Hillary Clinton. So there would be continuity. Instead, Donald Trump and immediately at some point came the story that they were negotiating in Doha 
uh, with the, the Taliban. I don't know, remember when that started, but certainly it was strange because the Taliban was never one thing. There were different elements in the Taliban, uh, different warlords who had fought the Taliban and then joined the Taliban over the years. There was no clarity. And, you, and I remember you reporting at Long War Journal that this is the Taliban they're talking to, not necessarily the most powerful, but it's an element of it. Yeah, I think the first time around, there was a lot of confusion about who the, who was talked to and whatnot. So what we had happened at that time period, John, was we had when the Taliban basically played weekend with Bernie, um, weekend at Bernie's with Mullah Omar's corpse. Remember, he di- actually died in 2013. And then they hid it for two years. And then when it was finally came around, there was a big sort of a breakup of the Taliban. And Sirajuddin Haqqani put the band back together. And I think once he did this, he was able to consolidate control and get a more centralized leadership. I think the Taliban still had a significant leadership under Mullah Omar, but it was, I think it really became far more centralized under um, the leadership. Of, he, obviously, he didn't take the helm. Mullah Mansour did. Sirajuddin was one of two deputies. And then once um, we killed Mullah Mansour in a drone strike, um, Mullah Habiatullah became the emir, Mullah Omar's son, who, by the way, was on the outs over the, all of the issues of the um, of the death of Mullah Omar and hiding it. He um, he um, he joined in with the plan. Like so, once I think the Haqqani's integ- reintegrated these groups, it gave the Taliban, the, the central Taliban, more control and more cohesiveness that allowed them to do the deal with Trump. Um, and so, but the Trump administration came in, they talked off on Pakistan, they cut off aid to the Pakistanis, which was long overdue. I think we gave a well over $30 billion to Pakistan to support the Taliban to kill American troops and sabotage our efforts there. Um, but then within about, I want to say about eight months or so, he turned on a dime and then he opened up negotiations with the Taliban. Um, what did you think about, um, that, that pivot by Trump? Was it uh, something you expected or was this? I, I, I regarded the whole thing as mysterious. Now, in retrospect, it was incoherent. And I think this really speaks to Trump as president in general, just a lot. You know, it seems like the good idea fairy hits. Let's talk tough on Pakistan. I'm sure that was General H.R. McMaster's influence, right? Trying to to reorient strategy in Afghanistan. At that same time, there was heavy targeting of the Taliban. During the time period of of that um, of the attacks on the Taliban, and I tracked the map, Taliban control plateaued at that point. It clearly these these strikes that the Trump administration approved, they really um, they had an effect on the Taliban's ability to take control of territory. But as soon as the negotiations up, up, opened up, it was back to the Taliban getting on the offensive because. The Afghan military wasn't able to to maintain control. Uh, uh, and that's a big part of the story, Bill. The hired government, Karzai and then his and then Ghani, his successor, were not integrated into the population. They they were they did not represent the people who were in the agricultural uh, horizon, you know, outside of Kabul, nor did they represent the middle class in Kabul. And the amount of money poured into Afghanistan over the years certainly led people to take make bad choices, corruption. And so while we were, our combat forces, NATO's combat forces were confronting the Taliban, there was very little reporting that trusted the Afghan National Army or the Afghan police. You yourself would document week after week. What do we call it? Green on blue, yeah, blue on green, green on blue. Those were the inside or insider attacks. Those were attacks where Taliban soldiers, for various reasons, often by influence of the Taliban, uh, to attack America and kill or wound American troops. Yes. And so what we had here was a very shaky, and it turns out to be non-existent Afghan army. Yeah, yeah, that was a big part of the story. As this was happening, the Afghan military is losing control. We had a bad strategy. We ceded rural areas to the Taliban. And um, you know, this is the whole nucleus for me creating that map was I've recognized that flaw in the strategy. 
Um, obviously, it wasn't just the strategy. It was the way the Afghan military was built. It was corruption. But, you know, the Taliban used to, the, uh, used to, I'm sure they, well, they don't do it anymore because the Afghan government doesn't exist. They mocked Karzai and they, then, and then Ghani and the Afghan government as being, they called Karzai and, and Ghani the mayor of Kabul. What they were saying was, sure, you control things there, but we, you know, outside of the capital, your influence is limited and, and, you know, mocked the Taliban uh, or the Afghan government as puppets. And these are put all these words in quotes, impotent, um, a tool of the West, uh, you know, all of those things. And the, the, the way the U.S. reacted, you know, again, by like, think about this too, John, like it's something we haven't, hadn't discussed, but the, the U.S. basically foisted Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah upon the Afghan people when they're the, the election couldn't be resolved. We just said, well, we'll make Ghani president and we'll make Abdullah Abdullah the, the CEO or chief executive officer of Afghanistan, whatever that means. Um, and this just provided fuel to the Taliban to, to go out into the, into the remote areas or even into, to, to, into urban areas and say, here's your government. Here's your tool. Here's your, here's your puppet, um, regime. And um, the, these types of mistakes, uh, the, you know, again, that that stemmed from decisions that were made decade decade plus prior. And um, yeah, we started we started watching this deterioration. The U.S. military was on board with the peace talks with the Taliban. And when I say peace, I put the quote, it really was a withdrawal deal. Um, and so we're going to fast forward. You had a couple of years of negotiations. And then, John, we have the. Signing on the deal, which was what February 29th, twenty twenty. Um, were you surprised that Trump actually cut this deal with the Taliban? At that point, you'd gotten me used to the idea that they were going <laughs> to sign the deal, whether whether there was promises or not. It turned out. I mean, it, there was nothing we could do. It seemed inevitable. Trump, the Trump administration, wanted to leave Afghanistan. We thought it was a bad idea, but we couldn't stop it. All we could do is report on the Taliban closing in on Kabul. That's all we could do. And we did it. You did it week after week at Long War Journal. Yeah, it was probably one of the more frustrating things. You know, we, you, you, I and Tom were just warning and warning. This is a bad deal. The, 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 if you look at the text of the deal, it's three and a quarter pages long. I've signed car loans, um, insurance policies and things longer than that. There was never any teeth to it. They told, you know, again, you had Secretary Pompeo telling us that the um, that uh, the Taliban were going to, quote, destroy Al Qaeda. Of course, that's not that it wasn't going to happen. Just look at what just happened several days ago with the killing of Zawahiri in Kabul um, was was maddening. And then so now we have at this point in time. And again, we reported this on your show, right, that the Taliban are, are, are smelling themselves at this point. They, they, they smell blood in the water. They, they're going out into the provinces and even into the, even into, you know, more developed urban districts and telling people your, your government's going to abandon you. The U S abandoned you. Remember the U S didn't allow the Taliban to enter peace or I'm sorry, to allow the Afghan government to be a party of the peace talks. One of the conditions was the Afghan government had to free 5,000 Taliban prisoners in exchange for a thousand Afghan, um, uh, for a thousand Afghan soldiers, police and government officials who were, um, in Taliban detention. It was, and, and, and the, the U S basically forced the Afghan government to do this. Um, and you know, at that point we knew it was over, right? I mean, we were talking about it. We were just documenting the failure, um, which was really frustrating. Right. And the, the, the explanation we were offered is it won't fall right away. Maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe after the fighting. Season. Well, first it was, oh, several years, right? The Afghan government will hold on. They could take, then it started going to six months. Then it started going to three months. Now this is, this gets us to the election of, of President Biden. Um, where the Taliban is starting to to take some districts. They, they probably increased between the point of, um, when the deal was signed until in about a year later, when a year plus later, when President Biden announced the withdrawal, the Taliban gained control of additional about 20 districts. And there we are. And they can keep more of their contested, but they're laying the groundwork for the offensive that's coming. Um, President Biden announced the withdrawal and he does so in a manner that I, 
you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but did that not seem like the most callous thing that you had heard when he had talked about the U.S. leaving? The explanation from the Wall Street Journal was that it was a political announcement timed for the anniversary, the 20th anniversary on 9-11, and that it was seen as a plus for the Biden administration's plans to turn its attention to domestic renovation after the pandemic. So it was all in terms of political language. It, it had very little to do with the battlefield. Yeah, I, I, I was I was actually this is one of the few things that shocked me, not that he made the decision to withdraw, John, but how he decided to withdraw. It was an immediate withdrawal. There was never any consultations with the Afghans with what they might need. He decided the decision was leave as quick as possible. And yes, you said the date for withdrawal. This might be the most tone deaf political thing that I've seen in my lifetime. He issued the date of withdrawal to be September 11th, 2021. 20 years to the day of uh, 9-11. He wound up after the furor over that, right? He he started to, he he knocked that back. And I believe the date that actually we withdrew was uh, August 29th, if I recall. Might have been 30th. It depends on the, the, the time. Well, the bug out was October, August 16th. Yeah, that's, that the, that's, when the the Afghan, that's when the Taliban took control of Kabul. And then it was two weeks after that where the Taliban, where the U.S. actually left. And then you started, you and Tom and uh, started uh, analyzing this decision, asking questions week after week. And I would ask you on air, where is the planning for air evacuation? Where is the planning for transportation out of a landlocked city, uh, out of a landlocked country? This isn't Vietnam. You show up at the dock and you got on a boat. This is going to require air air. Air coordination of extensive, you know, lots of 747s is what I was imagining. And then Bagram was abandoned and we were genuinely puzzled. What bothered me the most, I mean, the decision making was awful, right, John? But the no American general stood up and said, we can't abandon a Bagram. We're going to have to conduct this massive evacuation. So what happened was the Taliban takes Kabul. Our only air base is Kabul in the heart of a city of, and, and by the way, I've, I've been there. The airport isn't on, you know, a lot of cities, the airport might be eight, 10, 12 miles outside the city. Kabul International is essentially in the city. It's to the heart. And I mean, the very heart of Kabul in, um, of Kabul. And, and then the, uh, it actually it used to be Hamid Karzai International Airport. It was less than a mile. You can throw a rock and hit the airport. That, we were expected to, to do an evacuation and no one, no general said, I have to resign my commission. We can't do this. This is dangerous. This is irresponsible. I can't execute these orders. And I, and we never saw that. And, and here we are on air talking about this and going, what are they thinking? Why would they do this? It was absolutely maddening. And you've asked the question repeatedly. No one was fired. No. Or no one resigned, no one was fired, no one took responsibility. Um, but then I go back, you know, this goes all the way back to the beginning of 9-11 either uh, as well, John. Did George Tennant, the director of the CIA, resign? Did the FBI director at the time resign? No one resigned. But let's go, and then let's fast forward about uh, eight, seven or eight years. The uh the Lashkari Taiba attack in Mumbai, um, in in Pakistan. I'm sorry, in Afghan in, in India. You had Several senior security officials, I can't remember if it was the interior minister, or the, but several in India, in a country that is far less, um, you know, where or let's just say where we would consider the political institutions to be far more, far less developed than ours. You had people taking responsibility to me. I always bothered me about about 9-11 that no one fell on their sword for what happened. I understand it was complicated and there's a lot of issues, but no one, but instead what did the, you know, we had freedom medals given out by president Bush to, to, um, to Bennett. Right. I mean, that's the kind. And once that's instilled, I look back now and I could see that Afghanistan was destined to failure and that there would never be any, any responsibility for it. Act one, Bill. Act one. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yes. The this we are. We're at the end. No, no, John, before um 
I want to get your thoughts on Afghanistan going forward from here. We, as you said, we are, this is merely the end of act one, a, a 20 year act that was just a, a unmitigated disaster from on multiple levels. You know, we always say if what happened in Afghanistan stayed in Afghanistan, then, you know, we could brush this off as a, well, we lost, we lost the, you know, this little small war and this landlocked country and it would never, it wouldn't matter. But what happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. We saw that with 9-11. We've seen that. Um, and we've seen, you know, with Zawahiri being killed in, in Kabul, in the heart of Afghan, Taliban controlled Afghanistan. Um, what, and, and, and also I'd add to this how China and how Russia reacted to our withdrawal. Um, we, we now know that these countries have, um, have been emboldened, have, have worked to sabotage us to our, to our enemies. You, I'm sure, John, you talked to numerous individuals, right? On your program. They've had to have tell you this, that China and Russia have, um, have taken advantage of the, the U.S. weakness in Afghanistan. Is that correct? Certainly there's speculation. We don't have it yet, Bill, because we don't have the reporting necessary to assert that Moscow saw the Afghanistan story as a measure of American reluctance. I don't want to use the word timid. It's inappropriate. There's nothing timid about the U.S. military, but the military isn't the story here. It's the political class and the decision-making in Washington that without Afghanistan, we'd be more focused on what? I don't know. Because at that point, there was no Ukraine crisis, not even imagined. Did we imagine in August 16th of 2021 that there'd be a war in Europe that would threaten the foundations of the institutions since 1945? No, nobody thought that. So when and if we get the full report out of the Kremlin, we'll decide, we'll find out if they were speculating after August 16th, 2021, that if the, if we make a move on Ukraine, the U.S. will not react. They might have speculated that way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, John. So, John, you've done some extensive traveling in Central Asia. You've been to Kashkin, you've been to Baku, you've been elsewhere. What are they saying now about this? How the about U.S. withdrawal and U.S. abandonment of its Afghan allies? Um, the, what they're saying is get on the phone to Moscow and Beijing. That's what they're so, saying. So the U.S. withdrawal has had the effect of increasing the influence of of Russia in the region. Is that correct? It's Eurasia. It's the home team. Yep. And the U.S. power is no longer seen as unlimited. We can project power with our Navy, but we can't project power on the Silk Road with the Navy. Yeah, it's... And the Silk Road is what you're talking about, Mongolia to the South Caucasus. And so while they want to share in exploration of their futures, meaning technology from everywhere, and while they want to participate in selling to the European markets, hence the gas and oil pipelines out of the Caspian Sea Basin, they're aware of the fact that there are two military powers, China and Russia, that have to be satisfied when we make decisions about Washington. That's what they're saying. You've got to be practical. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the you know, the geography dictates, um, you know, who is the, who the powers are. Do these countries, um, do they view a Taliban controlled Afghanistan as a, as a direct threat to them or a, a, a secondary threat? Yes. 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 No one believes that the Taliban is going to stay in Afghanistan. No one believes that. And what country do you think is, is, is most threatened by the, I have my opinion on that. Um, but who, who do you think? I've been given different, I've been given different versions of that. Uh, it's because Al Qaeda is in there too, yes. Bill. So we can't separate we can. it out. The Taliban is like the home team and Al Qaeda is the one that can go overseas and bang for the buck. So they worry about the jihadists. The, the advantage, the, there is a plus. After uh, 70 years of Soviet occupation, there's very, very little left of the devoted jihadist worship. Very little left. These are secularized, modernized cultures that were ready to accept the internet, publishing, television, and uh, brand names that we're, that are consistent with our 
understanding of civilization. So there is, there is not the fertile bed in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. Um, I might have missed one. Sorry. There's not the, uh, uh, there's not the fertile bed of, of extremism that you can find in countries that are less developed or that were not occupied by the Soviets. All right, John. That, okay. would, that would be Afghanistan. So uh, last question for you. Yeah, as you noted, this is the end of our, our 20 year act one. I always joke that the uh, Afghanistan was the, um, uh, the worst soap soap opera on, on television. Um, it was called as Afghanistan burns and uh, season 20 was explosive. Um, so we are at the end of act act one. Um, I, I call your reports each week after Afghanistan. Yeah, That's what I, call. there we go. Right. Um, where does Afghanistan go from here? Is it, it do do we have any hope? Do you think there's a chance for the, a resistance to to take root? Uh, do we do we think the Taliban moderates? I you know uh, what do you, what do you what do you think the, the for the future is of Afghanistan is? I think Pakistan is unstable. I think Afghanistan is rudimentary and doesn't at this point. Uh, tell me anything about its stability because they're starving. I mean, you've got 20 million people said to be in starvation. You've got 2 million children who are going to uh, develop per- very poor skills because of their brains not being fed as as infants. So you've got a, a nation that is not really a nation. It's a failed state. It's an abandoned state. And Al-Qaeda is camped there. We talked last week, Bill, about do we have any information about the Al Qaeda training camps? You're re- you're an Al Qaeda recruiter. Zawahiri's death is a recruiting poster. They had to use their drone system because they're afraid of us. You understand how that rhetoric works. We've talked about it for years. That you kept a drone table in East Africa. I remember each week we would talk about it. The pace of droning. Drones recruit. They don't discourage. And Pakistan is a far more dangerous part because it's nuclear. We can never ignore that scenario we talked about for years, that the Pakistani nuclear arsenal is not secure from the jihad. We, you know, that's a reporting that has dried up over time, John. That's uh, something I'd forgotten about, how the nuclear security of Pakistan, that was a major concern of the U.S. And I think it's a big reason why the U.S. was reticent to uh, to really take it hard to to the Pakistani state. I think it was a mistake in retrospect, but yeah, that's a that's a, a great concern, one I hadn't thought about for, for years. And you're absolutely right, John, about the drones. The Al-Qaeda, we view it as, as a tool of strength I mean, it is effective at doing what it, what they do. And, um, we do need to take terrorist leaders and the key operatives off the battlefield. But Al Qaeda has always, and the Islamic State and other jihadists have always said their messaging on the drones is, see, they're afraid of us. They, they, they won't go toe to toe with us. This is how they have to do it. They have to use guile. They have to use, it's a, it, it's viewed as cowardly to them. And, and you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's, it, also, Bill, we didn't get any documents out of that house. Yeah. That that that's a point I've been making, John. Um, they, how do we further our understanding of Al Qaeda, of Zawahiri's role, of who's the who are the new up and comers, of what is Al Qaeda's strategy, and who they're talking to? How do we, you know, without that information from Zawahiri's file? Drones can't get on the ground and gather documents and gather hard drives. They launch missiles and leave. And we're, I'm not saying we needed to put boots on the ground to get Zawahiri. Maybe, maybe it was our only option, but it's, it's not the optimal solution to, to that problem. I can imagine a world, Bill, where Zawahiri is captured and put in the docket and charged with war crimes. And the documents are the evidence of his planning other war crimes. I can imagine that world. It's just not going to happen now. I could imagine that world about bin Laden. Take him alive and put him in the docket and make it clear what he is. Instead, they made martyrs. Yeah. And this is what the drone campaign sort of reduced everything to. Remember, we have to always go back to the Guantanamo, the criticism of Guantanamo. 
it actually had a perverse effect, right? It's, it's inhumane. It's illegal to detain terrorist leaders. So let's just kill them. And I always found the irony of that, that we'd rather kill someone than detain them. And even if the, 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 which I have criticisms of, right, of the justice process and, and Guantanamo, but, you know, summary execution of terrorist leaders doesn't help us understand the groups. And it certainly isn't any more humane than, um, than, a, than a, something like Guantanamo. End of act one. Thank you. Ben. John, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. It's been a, it's certainly been a challenge to, to, to switch the tables and I really appreciate your time and I look forward to joining your next show and the show after that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's episode of Generation Jihad. Just a reminder, you can find us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a review, preferably a positive one. Thanks again, and we'll see you all again soon.